I am going to set the stage as a CEO fireside chat. Bear with me one second. I th so we have our little fire. Yuletide log burning. Can you guys see that? Very nice. You guys probably can't see that. I just want to get properly dressed. Big shot. <laughs> so I am privileged to have <laughs> with me some four extraordinary case studies. There we go. Sorry. We are going to um, apply Jeff's abstract logic to some uh, very tangible and exciting four case studies in the industry. Uh, this panel probably doesn't need any introduction, but I'm going to let them talk for a few minutes about both their backgrounds and the company. And then I'm going to focus specifically on three important areas, sort of product, product roadmap, team build, and then capital formation, and try and bring Jeff's uh, advice to life through these case studies. So Dean, I'll turn it over to you to start. Dean Hovey, I'm President and CEO of Digifit. My original background is product design, which started many, many years ago. And from product design, I did a number of entrepreneurial companies. I uh, was a VC and um, also general manager in a couple of public companies. So I've seen the gamut of, of uh, experience, I'd say. I joined Digifit about three years ago with the focus of helping people learn healthy habits. Phil? Uh, I'm Phil Camp, uh, founder and CEO of uh, Valence Health. Uh, we've been around since 1996. so. I really only had one experience in, in doing this, and uh, we're in the business of supporting provider organizations getting into risk, both from a consulting, uh, analytics, and operational perspective. I'm Steve McHale, CEO of Explorus. Uh, started an investment fund uh, a few years ago. It's seed funded and spun out Explorus from the Cleveland Clinic. We focus on uh, big data analytics and computing for population health management and uh, analytics um, and data management and analytics for uh, the uh, uh, pharmaceutical industry as well. Okay, and my name's uh, Frank Williams. I'm the founder and CEO of Evelyn Health. Uh, I got involved in healthcare in the mid-90s uh, in another round of what's going on now. So a lot of bruises from some of the market realities and, and how hard it was to transform uh, the clinical and financial side of healthcare, and then I was CEO of the advisory board, a uh, public best practice research company that really serves 4,000 companies in the industry really over the last 12 years and still serve on the board there and recently launched Evelyn about three years ago. And Evelyn, similar to what these guys are doing, are really trying to work with organizations to transform clinically, but the key, of course, is bringing financial reimbursement along with it. So we're trying to marry both clinical and financial transformation so you can really push organizations to care for patients in a very different way. And so it's a, it's a terribly exciting time, obviously as evidenced by the audience and what's going on across the hallway. Uh, it's also a chaotic time. And so as we think about, one of my observations of the industry, if you limited the CEOs of, of many of the startups to two sentences to describe their company, they'd use the same two sentences. And so as you think about points of differentiation, really focusing on the product roadmap, Talk about some of the decisions, trade-offs you've made as you've thought about feature functionality and, and products into the market. So in, in no particular order, this is meant to be a dialogue. So please. Uh, well, I sort of jumped into Digifit uh, like a, a moving train, figuring it might be easier to, to jump on something that's moving than to start it from scratch. And uh, I'd say that there was some good parts about that and bad parts about it. But uh, we started in the fitness arena, uh, first company to have heart rate monitoring on an iPhone and, and uh, iPod. But uh, the no whole notion of tracking and fitness was a very limited market uh, compared to what I wanted to do from a healthy habits perspective. Um, and so transforming a, a company that was formed around that one specific to something much more general uh, hit has its challenges and difficulties because it's actually a much bigger scale in the, and one of the things that the earlier uh, presenter said was you really have to have a diverse mix of team as opposed to a bunch of technical geeks that I ha like to exercise. Others? So I, I speak to, um, 
From our perspective, one of the things that's important is we think about the management of care and moving, um, being putting providers in charge of the management of care is there is a product element of it, and then there is operational elements of it. So there is a strategy piece, there is a there is a products, a software piece, and then there is a services piece to have organizations actually succeed at risk. And from our perspective, it's important that organizations understand those three pieces and that those pieces tie together. So organizations that are that are focused on, for example, just product, they, I think they need to understand the end result, the you know the, the the result of where they're trying to go with the with the product. And I think partly you run into some issues if you're not at least understand the services part, understand how you're going to succeed at risk. You need to understand that piece as, before, as you develop your product. So you've got a lot of, of providers out there now thinking about getting into risk, and the knowledge base is not necessarily great on the provider side. So there's a combination of need versus want, and there's a lot of shiny objects, and the question is what is really necessary to actually manage the risk. So from a product standpoint, I think one of the things you need to understand is you know, how deep do you go on, for example, pulling EMR data as you look at clinical integration? What of those data elements really become important as you actually are trying to manage the care? So there are those kinds of things that I think are important. What are some of the lessons, Phil, that you've learned on that? Well, I think, again, that um, what you find is, um, generally speaking, phys physician, the, the key, one of the keys to me is what I would call a crawl, walk, run sort of philosophy to this, so that if you start with trying to get to the end game right away, you'll likely never get there. And so you've got to start slowly. And so the level of data that you'd actually utilize at the beginning may be less than you may plan in three to five years from now. Yeah. But I think you've got to balance what, what providers, physicians actually think they want versus what's reality and what they can get and actually manage. And so there's, there's, a, there's a reality piece I think that's important. Steve. My, my journey is a little unusual, I think. As we started into healthcare, at least for myself, as I started thinking about it, I had no experience with healthcare other than my personal um, uh, you know, interfaces with uh, doctors that uh, took care of me. And I'd say that um, the spark really was, there's a lot of data. And I was sitting there thinking about uh, actually a diagnostic procedure I was having and I was looking at this machine and all the data it was generating and, and when I was done, I said, what are you going to do with that? And he tore off a piece of paper and threw it in a folder and this was about eight years ago. So when we, when we had the idea or I had the idea to come into healthcare, I surrounded myself with a couple more people and the whole idea was to build a, a very high performance computing superstructure just for the data. So we didn't really have a vision yet of what the solutions were going to be uh, to transform care. Our first thought was just build a massive computing infrastructure that would be able to deal with enormous amounts of data that would be flowing in from many, many uh, sources. And then how do you learn about that data, rationalize that data, and then find real use cases that have meaningful uh, impact on the delivery of care. So it's been an evolution. We're five years old. Uh, we were five years old October 6th, so we're, we're still standing, which we're uh, pretty proud of. And, um, and as we've evolved and we surround ourselves, our whole idea was to crowdsource and surround ourselves with health systems and thought leaders that could teach us uh, how to take our skills around uh, data and high performance computing and then drive solutions uh, for them in alignment with the needs in the market. So, uh, you know, as we heard, you have to bring together both the risk side of things and understanding payment, reform, remuneration, but at the same time, clinical transformation. So we spent five years aligning ourselves and bringing people into our organization that could help us really put that vision together, but we built it on a bedrock of knowing data. And that's, that's probably our greatest core competency. So, you know, I think um, we have a lot to learn. And, you know, we've, we've made a number of mistakes along the way, which... Yeah, and so, Steve, yeah. to that point, in the, the early days, talk a little bit about kind of the hunting and pecking for the white space in the market. You had this incredible data repository. How did you begin, you know, what were some of the early insights and how do you productize that? One of the things we do, which is, fairly, I think, fairly unique, is 
you know, we came more from a transformative uh, web environment culture, and we surround ourselves with folks that came in that world, uh, came from that world. So we did iterative prototyping. So we would do really rapid prototyping uh, with the uh, partners that we were trying to attract. So we would literally sit with them and try to understand the issues. We, we always bonded product management with engineering so that we didn't have this separation of church and state. So we had a, a full meld of, the, of really the thinking uh, in one place. So we could very quickly uh, iterate, build prototypes, validate as it relates to their, their meaningful um, contribution into the workflow. And then once we had a good hit with that, it was what we call fire a test bolt, we'd go back and scale it. Yeah. So that, yeah. that, that's really how we learned on the fly, basically, yeah. by getting in and doing that iterative process. Yeah. It, was yeah. very, it was really, it helped us a lot, helped us learn quickly. And Frank, you've scaled an enormously interesting company. Maybe early lessons learned? Well, I was just going to say, I mean, I think it's really interesting that my entry in was almost the exact opposite of yours. And sometimes you start with what you have, but uh, we always, from our history at the advisory board and learning a lot from the founder, David Bradley, started with the macro. So what, what is the real <laughs> larger shift going on in the industry? And then spent a tremendous amount of time with customers, with CEOs, and really understanding the problem at an intimate level of detail. So the vocabulary of how they talk about it, <laughs> what they struggle with, and based on that, I, I'll be honest, I ended up in a business that I didn't necessarily want to be in, but to Phil's point earlier, I thought was the business that the customers needed. And what I mean by that is, you know, selling and producing software is a lot easier <clears throat> than driving broad clinical transformation across an organization, but what we found is that health systems were really struggling. Yes, they could talk the talk in terms of wanting to move towards accountable care, all the same words we use, but when you really ask them, wait, do you have an integrated strategy? You know, have you thought through what product lines you're gonna be in? Have you put together the financials? Do you have the talent within your organization? We would hear very consistently that they didn't. And so that made us step back and realize that the success of a, a Geisinger or a Kaiser or UPMC is actually based on the integration of those pieces not 10 different initiatives going on. And so as a result, we went big and decided, you know what, from strategy all the way through to full operational execution, we are gonna provide the expertise people process. It's a much more complex business. It's hard, uh, very hard gravel road, but I actually think it's what the industry needs right now. And, mm -hmm. and I'd say um, this is something you're all gonna face, which is uh, a lot of times customers aren't ready for the innovation you're bringing them. And I thought what Phil said earlier about you know, walk before you run, you have to lead customers there. You have to figure out a way to get in and solve a problem that's on their current agenda and then hopefully build trust and get them to take bolder risks, particularly in an industry where people don't take big risks. And, and be, to follow up on that, to be really tactical, getting kind of first dollar, the first olive out of the bottle is always the hardest. How, what are some strategies in the earlier days to get those first accounts? What are, you, what are you seeing in the market today? Are the, is it a mature market? Yeah, I mean, uh, one thing we would go do is do our best to get anyone to talk to us. So develop a script that we're gonna share best practices. We're not here to sell. We're really here to talk to you about insights that we're learning. And most people, if you have some credibility, will take that meeting. So if we could get face to face, we then try to tell them about what we're doing, and then we invited a number of them to a, what we would call a charter roundtable meeting in Washington. So 25 people around the table, you know, CEOs, feeling like they're really designing the product along with us, feeling enfranchised. And then once we got all that information, it's your iteration process. Of course, what we had first round wasn't right, and we changed it and changed it and brought it back. And uh, it's interesting, I'll be honest, I mean, ultimately the ones that we ended up closing first were ones where I had close personal relationships. I mean, that really helped because they were taking a big risk. Um, and just this process of, of uh, iterating as you go along, the market is not mature at all. Um, I mean, just to be clear, the bulk of the industry is not making a bold move into risk and value-based care. There are a small portion of zealots that are moving or in markets that are really competitive where they're sort of getting a stomach punch from somebody else, they're then moving. But the bulk of the industry is piloting, you know, doing a number of things, but not really pushing the organization to transform because I mean, one of the 
dirty little secrets out there is a lot of providers and particularly health systems are making very good money right now. And so it becomes difficult when you're making, you know, one of our customers is making almost a billion dollars in EBITDA. Mm. It's hard to then push and go to your board and say, hey, we're going to blow that up and, and, and move to risk. So, yeah, I, I would support what Frank's getting at. So what we find is the ones that are probably thinking more along the lines of changing the system are the number two or three players in a marketplace, not yeah. the number one player in the marketplace. And so that becomes, you know, um, a key element is, you know, who do you pursue as far as clients in the space? And I would agree. I think almost every health system in the country is thinking about this, and they're trying to figure out what to do. And they're, one of the issues is around how do they, you know, they know today that they're almost all fee for service, and they know 10 years from now they're going to be almost all value-based care. And the question is, how do they how do they transit transition yeah. that? Yeah. They're a little distracted, I think, with consolidation. We're we, you know we're at the front row seat. We we did this in banking and telecom too. We we watched that process as it uh, transformed the market significantly, and that's happening now. And it's going to be significant. We're going to see um, who knows what we'll have. You know, 200 mega systems in 10 years, mm -hmm. but we know there's going to be big consolidation, and you know, when they have that on their radar screen at the same time, you're coming in and telling them, okay, now we're going right. to do payment reform and, you know, we're going to uh, do value-based care uh, purchasing, we're gonna, you know, all these kinds of elements, it's, it's a bit of overload. And as you look at the balance sheets, you almost have to scan the balance sheets to figure out who's going to be left standing. And as we kind of joke about it at our shop, we, you know, it's the healthcare hunger games. And, yeah. and that's what it's, what's <laughs> turning into is what's you know what is going to be left standing as this comes comes to you know comes to fruition. Yeah, and I was just going to say just to use an example. I know a lot of you may have products or services that are pretty bold, and you're trying to sell into the market. And you've got to do your best in, in healthcare to to find the flow of money um, right. and people who actually have the budget authority to make a decision. And one small example in our case is one place that no one can argue with is starting with your own employees as a health system in terms of starting to manage that population because there's total alignment. So if you can then talk about, wait, you can save you know, 10, 15, 20 million dollars um, by just starting with your own employees, that gave them an easy way to jump in the water. Yeah. And I would say for those of you that are doing particularly the care management, disease management stuff, it's you know, can I find something, readmission, something that they're on the hook for financially now and start with that problem and then iterate out into other areas and, and, and you'll get believers along the way and trust and then be in a position when they really need you and they're really being aggressive uh, to, to be in a position to serve them. So, so let me take a, a different perspective on that sure. in um, you debate this. So, so I agree that uh, for health systems to start with their own employees, it makes a lot of sense. The piece of it that you, it, it's not enough because what happens is when you think about it, um, if you, what you're really trying to do is change the behavior of physicians in this process. And if you look at any health system and the percentage of the physician's business that is associated with the employees of the health system, it's one to two percent. And so there's, it's, it doesn't change, that in and of itself won't change behavior. So you've got to get that number in a, to a much higher percentage for expect to be any change. So, so one of the issues I have is, is, you know, it's like the MSSP program, Medicare program, where they're trying to do training wheels. And I think starting with your employees is an approach to doing training wheels. Yeah. The problem with it is if, it, if the result of that is not success, people are thinking this doesn't work. And so you, my perspective is you have to have a larger piece of the business. You have to either, if you're going to pilot something, pilot something with a, with, a, with a physician group that has enough of their business or pilot on a Medicaid or a Medicare process. But if you're just doing 2% of their business, physicians are not going to pay attention to it. So I think, that's, I, th I think it's an important piece that you transition, that you start with. But very quickly, you're, gonna, you're, you're not going to get the results that you expect unless you get the percentages to a higher percentage. And there's really a hybrid right in the middle, which is if you want to change the behavior. In the, so your, Phil, to your point is right on 1%, 2% is what we see. So you may have a panel of 2,500 with you know, 100 or not even that, 50 patients that are employees. And so, but put the solution in the, in the training and the change management around that so they can start to get that effect on the other patients 
but that's where it starts to hit the balance sheet, and that's that's where that's where you start running into resistance. So it's it's really, it's it's tough. It's a challenging situation. Yeah, and and, and look, I would agree with Phil 100. Mm percent I think I'm trying to reflect on those of you in entrepreneurial positions selling into new markets where if you go in and say, I'm going to sell you a bold, very expensive yeah. solution around chronic patient management, it's very challenging to do. And so you've got to stay true to what's going to work, but you've got to anchor people on something that they can buy and that they can bite off on and not take too much risk. Right. And then to Phil's point, I think you need a roadmap to a real strategy, but you've got to get in the door somehow, which I know a lot of young entrepreneurs really struggle with. <laughs> So, so conjecture on how this market's going to evolve over the next three to five years, pick, pick that time frame. You've got a consolidating customer base, arguably. I think we're all seeing evidence of that. You've got, uh, you know, in the venture landscape, this is one of the most, this is the hottest category right now. A lot of capital's coming in. You've got a lot of new companies been created. How does this play out over the next couple of years? As executives who have run it, running companies that have broken out, and you, know, you sit in an interesting perch looking out over the horizon. How, how does this market evolve over the next three to five years? Uh, one of the observations I've had is that um, healthcare is uh, intensely investment situated. So people are thinking about building buildings. Donors are thinking about putting names on buildings. Uh, you're buying equipment. And all these things have lives of 10, 20, 30 years, which means that they have to get amortized and the whole business model sits there. So um, until that changes where the spending committee says, well, we're going to spend 30% next year on what I'll call software, not necessarily electrons, but all those other things that could be towards wellness prevention, et cetera. Um, you know, we're going to have a hard time because the, the model keeps moving downstream. However, as you look at the changes, and you know, Rhea Bindus is obviously a, a good one to look at, what are those areas where they can take uh, those baby steps to fix certain situations that they know are on the path to where it's going to be 10 years from now, but help them take that first little step. So uh, maybe we don't really want physicians to change their behavior so much. Maybe we want them to prescribe an experience along with a pill mm. <laughs> that will change you know, how they uh, eat and exercise and have the pill, and everything gets better. So there's those opportunities of those small steps along the way, as long as you know where you think the endpoint is. So Dean, that argues for there's plenty of white space for innovation. There'll be a lot of new point solutions being introduced to the market. That can all coexist in a landscape that arguably customers become potentially with budget more powerful. You've got a proliferation of other vendors. So you see a lot of white space still, to, still in the market. It's not a consolidating vendor market. Well, in the sense that there is a lot of opportunity for innovation, and some of that is going to get consolidated. I mean, you have to have some scale to, to be recognized. But on the flip side, having a personal relationship with some folks that trust you, that also have a sense of wanting to change and be innovative, that's really key. And then looking at something, the difference between a New York press and a Dartmouth Hitchcock, you know? The populations that they serve have completely different needs, and trying to match what you might be best at uh, comparatively is, is really a, another place to start. And one, one thing I'd add, I mean, I think if you look at the early experience from the exchanges, uh, which I think all of us would agree are going to you know, increase in terms of penetration, most of the people who went on the exchanges, when they had a choice to buy up or down, bought down. So they were willing to buy narrower network products, and they were buying on value. If you look at the behavior of a lot of large employers, um, unions that have choices between wage increases and narrower networks, people are buying narrow networks. So yeah. that trend has just started, and we know the broad pressure on healthcare costs. So I think one thing we know is there's going to be a very big focus on value, and therefore providers are going to have to deliver greater outcomes at lower cost. Um, all the things that help to do that, that, that you guys do, are going to be a very important piece of that. Um, and I think we're going to see a transference of risk uh, to providers that are ready to accept it, because it's a much easier way. The only way the economics work, a lot of these you know, shared savings deals from payers just simply don't go around the block. You know, giving a 50-50 deal with a provider that's keeping people out of the hospital doesn't work. And so there has to be a greater transference of risk 
into either physician or provider-based organizations to make the whole equation work. So those are just a couple you know, larger yep. trends that I see then driving product strategy, data strategy, et cetera. So I, would, I, would agree with, I would agree with Frank. So, and I think what you're going to see is a, is a trans, and it's interesting on the pay, so I think there's going to be a transition of responsibility for, the, for population health from, let's call it, it was the, it's the payers mm -hmm. and moving to the provider world. And so uh, the question the payers are going to have to challenge themselves with is their role going forward. And so, because providers, you know, we've always believed providers should be in charge of how healthcare is delivered. And I think that the, to do that, you have to be responsible for the quality and the cost. And what Frank's getting at around the risk, that's really the only way that providers really have the right to take that responsibility for the quality of care because they also have the responsibility for the, for the cost of care. So I think you're going to see a shift to providers away from insurers. And then, you know, I think the client, you know, but, but providers don't know how to manage they manage patients, not consumers, not people. Okay. And so there's going to be a lot of effort in that space at the same time. I want, I want to move to another basket of issues. Um, I haven't done this math scientifically, but my suspicion is 70% of venture dollars, at least in the early stage, goes to pay salaries. So building team is a huge investment you're making, the investors are making. Some observations around team build, Phil, maybe I'll pick on you, I know your story. You've built an extraordinary team, you've assembled it sort of handcrafted. Talk about some of the lessons learned, either mistakes made or observations as you think about scaling, when to bring in certain competencies, how you thought through that. Yeah, I probably have more what not to do's than to do's. Um, but so just a little history of the company. So we started in 96 with no investor. Um, we spent, we in 2012, so we spent 16 years or so without any investor and basically um, bootstrapped an organization together and got it to a pretty pretty decent sized organization um, and then got an investor. So um, we built our team and then, but there were a lot of missing parts and, and we realized that to, to really scale the business. So we were, we really weren't in a position to think about scaling the business for, for many years until we had that investment. And we then realized all the missing pieces that we had. So one of the things that, that we find has been a, an incredibly important thing for us, and it's, it's squishy, but it's culture. And so we find that that culture that you establish in the organization, as you add new executives to the team, you've got to continue that culture. It becomes very important that and, and as you grow from 100 people to 500 people, how do you continue to keep a culture? So I think you have to spend time on it. One of the things that I do is I do quarterly um, meetings with our entire staff just to pe let people know what's going on. Uh, new employee lunches I do once a month kind of thing. So trying to, um, to keep the culture I think is important. And then adding, as you add people, you've got to, the kinds of people you're going to add, certainly at an executive level, have to fit into the way you want to operate as in our organization, we try to be entrepreneurial. So it's those kinds of people that and we try to. And how do you think to... about trade-off? Because you, you took a deliberate strategy to um, build the team maybe more organically and slowly versus building it all up front and hoping the revenues flow. How, how do you think about that trade-off? Um, well, we didn't. I don't think we had a choice. So again, we had no funding at the beginning. So it was, we had revenues that supported the organization. Yeah. We, I kind of feel like we started out for many years like, you know, maybe some of our parents that, that grew up in the in the depression and, and always, even if they're they have money now, they still think about <laughs> how they spend money, right? So we we hold on to those dollars as tightly as we can um, in that process. So um, we built our team as as we were able to build a team. I can't yeah. say we built so we had people um, we probably had people doing things beyond their capability for a long time, but they also learned the business in a, in a greater fashion than when we were able to. We added the team that we needed to add. Maybe because Frank, yeah, you're at the I other think, end. Or? Again, our story is starting with we didn't know what we were going to do. So the first thing we defined was wrote some founding notes about who we were going to be. I said, so we're, you know, if we come in, we're coming in to learn. So we're going to be very input oriented. We're going to be a developmental environment. So we knew that if we were going to attract the best talent and we were going after high tech talent, uh, you know, competing with Google and Facebook and Yahoo. So we had to have a culture and environment that was very uh, exciting for them. So we, we, we centered around three core values, which was accountability, 
do what you say you're going to do, <laughs> empowerment. So we wanted to create an environment that allowed our teams to form rapidly, quickly, small, iterate, think, bring ideas forward, and rapidly uh, drive um, value um, out to the market as we understood, uh, as, we, as we watched it um, evolve. And because we knew the market was changing in front of us, we were always clear with our team. And then ethics was our third value, which is we had to be honest and open and direct with everybody, including competitors, and, and uh, be upfront about it. So I think that foundation helped us uh, really steer through a pretty tumultuous environment. You know, we were, we were just, a lot of things were coming at us, and we, were, we didn't want to knee jerk and just react and, and dive on everything. So we, we had to collect that information. We had to collaborate with each other as a whole team and understand what it meant. And then, uh, so we have very frequent updates with the organization weekly. We have a stand up where we all get in a group and we, we do a, a very quick review of what's going around in the business. Uh, we, have, we have very frequent um, collaboration meetings and sessions that we form to, to really understand what's happening in the market and, uh, and how we should um, proact to that. So that, that culture, a developmental environment, and a concept of servant leadership, and that doesn't mean we're cream puffs and you know, people can do whatever they want. It just means that you know, we're, we're, very, uh, we're very clear about what's expected of each other, but we're also there to serve each other and help each one of our people be the best they can be and develop. And that's, I know it sounds like a lot of culture talk there, but it, it's, um, you know, in five years, we were able to accelerate into a, a, a good market strength position pretty quickly. Well, an interesting, and, uh, unlike other industries that have clustered on the coast, the two of you have successfully built companies in uh, cities that aren't necessarily linked to the internet, not the, the big data, not yeah. the Valley or Boston or New York. Um, any any issues around that? Were there days where you thought you, you needed to relocate the companies, or were, you were there was plenty of talent in Cleveland and Chicago? Well, there was. There's been a few moments, you know, where we felt like uh, when there was top talent we we really wanted that uh, made us um, flinch. But we we centered back in, and we're about growing, right? So we're bringing you know kids out of Carnegie Mellon, U of M, Ohio State, all over, really, from uh, and and growing them. Uh, as it comes to top talent, uh, we developed that as well from a mid-tier that we started with. But um, I think um, we don't regret that. We like being, you know, we're really centralized. We're brought the whole team together. We've got some remote folks for implementation, advisory, consulting, uh, that sort of thing. But essentially, it's, it's worked out well. We've found banks to be a great farm team. So, I, yeah, I think um, we have not had a problem with, with recruitment at all. We have four offices. So we have an office in Philadelphia, Corpus Christi, um, Austin, and Chicago. And, um, you know, we hire a lot of different types of people. So it's not all data IT kinds of people. Yeah. So, for example, we have, you know, 75 people that are customer service people. And so, you know, we, there's different types of teams. We have hourly people. We have different kinds of people. And we have uh, we have not found Chicago to be a problem in in any in any sort of recruiting way. Other thoughts around team or? Well, I was just going to say, um, you know, I was joking before, but I remember my friend who took over Survey Monkey uh, had forty million in revenues and eleven employees, and <laughs> I like that business a lot more than mine. <laughs> uh, we've hired seven hundred people in three years, and um, that's a hard thing to do. And I'd say one of the things I learned really from other people I've worked with is not thinking of career management HR as an admin function, but thinking of it as a real strategic function in the company and getting someone who's been on the product side who really understands the type of talent that you need uh, in that function and then really investing and building out recruiting, making sure your senior team knows that it's not a hassle to have an interview in the afternoon to bring someone new in that that's part of your job and that's the only way we're going to scale and then building a whole support organization around the things that people really care about which is you know I think a lot of what you touched on culture um, having a sense of mission and passion for what the company is doing celebration and recognition career development so we're really invested in people's career paths and then communication which I think a lot of people have touched on that if you're moving incredibly fast 
you can really lose people very quickly. And sometimes we'll be at our firm-wide meeting. How many people have you joined in the last six months and half the room goes up? And you realize very quickly that you can lose that. And I think my dream is, you know, five years from now that the 5,000th employee that joins cares just as much about the culture as the fifth person. And that takes a tremendous amount of work, but that's the that's ultimately what holds a company together. I mean, I think it's interesting, you know, four very successful people, or three at least, up here uh, in terms of what they've done. And a lot of people talk about culture, but you realize that it really does hold the organization together. And if you, can, if you have a decent business model and you invest in attracting the best talent, you, that becomes a differentiator in terms of how you win in the market. The other thing going on, I think, that uh, we're all seeing is there's a, there's a lot more emphasis on the things that we're all talking about. So yeah. the, the supply of the talent versus the demand, are they're out of whack. And so um, I think that accentuates the things that Frank's talking yeah. about. So we're competing with people, you know, to hire people. I know sure. that. And, um, you know, it's, 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 it's not, it's things beyond compensation. I mean, certainly that's part of it, yeah. but how do, you, how do you attract those people to your organization is important. Any other perspectives, Dean? Well, I, I live in a completely different world. Our, we have 20 full-time people, so, uh, and two tough <laughs> places, jealous. two, two plus jealous. places to have a business in Santa Barbara and Silicon Valley. Uh, so, so give us the Valley perspective. It's, it's Well, the Valley, it, what's great about Santa Barbara is that it is a bit of an island, uh, but even still, Apple reached out and grabbed one of our best young engineers and put it on the watch team because you know she knew all about heart rate monitor yeah. and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But in general, we're isolated from that um, piece. The flip side is that there's so much going on in Silicon Valley around e-health, mobile health, that you have to be in that buzz. You have to sort of be right in the pulse. Yeah. And, and that's actually where I've been from, so I'm doing a lot of back and forth. Um, so it's it's a real it's a real dilemma from that perspective, and that you you want that. So we actually had a, a space that was larger than our needs, and subleased to another company that wasn't in in the health space, but was doing some of the technology that was similar, and so we we could have those conversations happening, uh, and we were helping each other yep. even though we didn't have a scale. So again, you you start to think about well, how can we accomplish some of these things even if yep. it doesn't work. Let's spend a minute on finance, capital formation. Then if people have questions, we'll, we'll certainly solicit questions in a minute. Uh, as I said earlier, it's a white-hot category. Um, Frank, you've exploited it you know, brilliantly. Um, talk a little bit about uh, the environment for raising capital. Obviously, revenues is the best source of capital, absent revenues. You know, what were some of the things you think you did particularly well, some of the things you might have done over again? Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, I think we did a good job of articulating how significant the market uh, could be. Uh, and so doing a lot of education about that, about having early customers, I mean, that made a big difference. People could pick up the phone and call and see how we were doing. Uh, uh, having a real plan, I mean, sometimes you go into a fundraising, honestly, honest moment, you're like, you know, God, what are we going to do with the money? We have to answer that question when they ask and just a lot of work um, on the financial model. And I think you know, what I've learned, particularly at the level we raise money, is you know, private equity people don't give away money easy. Um, and if you think they're gonna take the first spreadsheet, I mean, I've never seen you know, more diligence um, and looking at every number, and that's what makes them good at what they do. So you better be prepared for that process because if you can't answer those questions well, how does the business scale, how are you gonna get to break even, you know, why is this part of the business not scaling? You're gonna find yourself in trouble. And I'd say generally as a leader and manager of a business, that's true. <laughs> so really understanding the, the economics of your business, it, it, you know, you swarm yourself in it for weeks and you'll always be able to tap into that when you're making decisions later. But look, we were fortunate enough to have some, you know, great interested investors. We stayed small with three that we thought were premium and you know played them off of each other a little bit and ended up with what we thought was a great partner. Great. You know, I'll, I'll um, extend the concept of uh, prototyping. That was something that, that was said. You know, a, a financial spreadsheet is a prototype. And so 
keep building those things, keep doing the what ifs, where's the assumptions, and you, you start to see where the thing breaks. And that's, that in itself is a learning model too. So uh, investing in that time. Now, the other part is sometimes you, you, you get distorted in your reality and you make this wonderful growing company not based so much on those things because you, know, you just change a few numbers in the spreadsheet. But it, it really is a valuable way to get into your business in a deep way. Other thoughts so, around so, uh, success? Our experience may be, again, slightly different. So we spent 16 years without an investor. Um, and so in some of the things that were important to us as we looked for an investor was um, good or bad that, that the executive team could stay in charge. And so we, we were able to you know, first identify the amount of money that you need and make sure that you can, you know, for us, one of the key elements was, was to, to remain in charge so that the, the money was not in charge. And so that was an important element uh, for us. The second element that I would say if I, uh, I would do it a little differently just because it was the first time that we did it was evaluating uh, partners relative to what they could bring to us. So it was, it, it wasn't really, I mean there are, in this space there are um, many firms that would like to invest in organizations like ours. And so we may be in an, um, a unique situation, but understanding how they're going to help you grow, grow your business, I think, is a very key element as you evaluate uh, potential investors. So, so I'd, uh, I'd just add, add yeah. one quick thing, which is, again, here, I think relationship matters. So if I was a young entrepreneur and I could get time with you, even if it's not to ask for money now, but to have you get to know me, yeah. because you look at so many things, yeah. I think over time that makes a big difference and ultimately ended up going with people where we had relationships and the trust was there and the speed of the deal was very fast as a result of that. So sorry for interrupting. It's similar to Phil. We, you know, my investment group that I lead, we consider ourselves invention capital and deep life cycle control. That was our objective. We learned our way. We, we learned lessons along the way with other businesses. This is uh, number 3.5 for me. It'd take 10 minutes to explain the point five, but uh, so you know when we learned that we said we want to have deep deep life cycle control, uh, similar. And so as we took on capital, we, we relative we took on very little uh, for for Explorus, and then our investment group uh, was able to maintain um, control, you know, enough control to where we felt like we could, uh, you know, lead the market and, and uh, not have somebody else take us and. You know, take us sideways. Apologies, it's hard to see yeah. with the, the lights, but please, you have a question? By the way, it's a very impressive fire. I know those speakers can't see. <laughs> Frank, could you throw a log on the fire? It's getting kind of hot. The other thing I'd like to say thank you uh, very much to the four of you, and especially thank you for Michael uh, and the meetings putting this together. Really, very good discussion. Uh, I'm glad you brought up the, the issue of culture. You talked about culture in your own organization. And I want to take a few steps back to the beginning of the conversation, which was focused much more so on the healthcare customer and the role of culture. We're going through a transition towards risk-based reimbursement. Uh, in the old world, the marginal cost of transaction was very important. You want to really lower that to the lowest possible level. In the new world, the emerging world, it's really the marginal effectiveness of a transaction that's important. That is, how much does the current transaction reduce or eliminate the need for future transactions, future encounters with the healthcare system? Very important. I have worked uh, with the NHS for a number of years, and the NHS in England went to risk-based reimbursement under the uh, uh, reforms under Tony Blair. A lot of people don't realize that. Everybody had risk, whether it's the GPs or secondary care. The problem the NHS was very interesting is culture. That is, the managers were all the same managers, and particularly the mid-level managers, who grew up in a world of, let's just focus on cost, on performance managed by not overspending. How does culture, how do, what role do you think culture is going to have in these healthcare organizations as we go forward hmm. with risk-based reimbursement? You know, we've talked about the, an obstacle being the physicians. But we never, ever talk about an obstacle being the managers and administrators in these healthcare organizations. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to that? Because at the end of the day, they're the ones who are making a lot of these key decisions. And are they going to make the decisions 
that are required to move forward, or do we need a whole new class of managers, which takes a lot of time? Thank you. Yeah, fascinating question. I mean, I'll comment on it. I mean, I, the reality is I think it's hard for any of us um, who are running certain businesses to start new and different businesses within, you know, as much as we want to, your historical culture, the way people think, influences the way you launch those new businesses. And this is a massive issue with health systems trying to move in this direction. So I think it's a giant issue. Um, it's a core change management is a core competency we've really tried to invest in. So how do you really educate the, the, the customer, bring them along, you know, get short-term wins, build trust? I mean, all of those things are ultimately going to be critical. We do believe that you want to create almost a separate organization. Um, and, and as a matter of fact, the launch of Evelyn was really because we as the advisory board realized we could never do Evelyn if we tried to do it within the advisory board. It was an honest like surrender admission that it has to be done with separate focus and separate talent. And I think health systems are going to need to do that. And what we see and what Phil knows so well is a lot of organizations then penalize the new business they're launching. So yep. they charge their highest price to their own health plan versus saying, wait a minute, we've got to set separate culture, separate business, but ultimately do the things to make it very successful. I think this is one of the most important, yep. you know, great question, most important competencies that organizations are going to have to adopt to be successful. And, for, and frankly, it was one of our big, you know, stumbles when we came in. We were the big technology, big data, we showed up, dropped it off. <laughs> very quickly went, whoa, it's not, <laughs> people aren't embracing it. And so that was a really uh, uh, rapid learning moment for us where we said, okay, we have to move into a programmatic uh, uh, approach here, which aligns with what both Frank and Phil shared, but baby step it. Because if you try to really quantum leap that, you're, you're not going to bring people with you. So if you just get the whole just one step going, you know, maybe it's these measures and we make this change and we get this quality behavior involved in this process happening and you just keep working your way forward until people start realizing that they're really doing things differently. And that's, that's been a, a real eye opener for us that we, we had to really start to focus on about, about two and a half years ago. And one quick thing I would add, given this dilemma for all of you, for us, customer selection is critical. So in the process, really understanding, you know, is the CEO committed? Are they really willing to commit the dollars? Can you really put up some gates to test? Because the toughest thing, of course, is getting in and then finding out they're not committed to the strategy. You're trying, your team's on the ground trying to make it successful, but you were, you were sort of beat from the very start. That's great. I'm sorry I didn't see you earlier. We could have talked a lot more about that. I'm getting the hook uh, to wind up. There's okay. also a woman whose hair is glowing. I don't know if you, I'm going to be the only one who can see it. So we should all go we over and see what there, that's all about. Yeah. But thank you. Thanks. Thank Thanks, you. my panel. Hey, thank you.